was an April shower, spring made flowers. So oh, the next so time, what is what? What are made flowers for? Pilgrims. 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 Yes. Ooh. So the next time I'm down here, which will be soon, I expect to see all the flowers will be out and blossoming and things are greening up. I um, want to thank you tonight for uh, coming to the kind of town hall and the listening session on uh, Medicaid expansion. I am joined uh, by my assembly colleagues from La Crosse and La Crosse County, Representative Jill Billings. Uh, joins us from the 95th Assembly District and represents Steve Doyle from the 94th, which is everything outside of La Crosse and La Crosse County. Um, several of our colleagues, we are doing these listening sessions around the state uh, to hear from you, but also to give you some information about uh, the inclusion of this in Governor Evers' budget. And so we are pleased that Governor Evers is kind of the vessel for Medicaid expansion here in Wisconsin and what that means uh, in access to health care, what it means in behavioral health, mental health services, what it means for uh, addressing opioids and the addiction here in Wisconsin, uh, what it means for reimbursement rates for uh, the medical, um, for, uh, for doctors, for nursing homes and things like that. We are being live streamed right now, so people know that, that we have that opportunity that on Facebook that um, so tonight's discussion will be out there and available for people who can't join us here tonight. So I thank you for the services of uh, being live streamed tonight as we talk about this discussion. And um, I we will go through the slideshow and kind of kick it off. I will turn, I think, Jill, do you start off? Oh, Steve, Representative uh, Doyle starts off first. And we will go through these slides uh, and it kind of is, um, allows us to kind of get some, if you've got questions or thoughts, and then after the slideshow, we can kind of have this uh, discussion and Q&A on this and what this means uh, would mean for you and our community, our state, uh, and uh, as we move forward, kind of what the timeline is on the budget. So with that, I will hand it over to Representative Doyle. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thanks for coming out tonight, uh, Amy Lane. We really appreciate seeing you here. Uh, this is an important topic for us um, because this is really kind of the crux of how the governor is talking about funding so many things that are important to us, not just in the healthcare area, but education and so on and so forth. Um, and so because this is really the linchpin of that, we thought that it's important to get out to the people throughout the state so that you understand a little bit better what we, talk, what we mean when we're talking about these issues. So when we say Medicaid expansion, when we talk about Medicaid in Wisconsin, we're really talking about Badger Care. And Badger Care is a program that has been aimed at lower income people. And I, I want to talk about that for just a moment. When we say lower income, we're not talking the poorest of the poor. In, in many cases, we're talking about the working poor. And, and this is a, a program that um, helps people that otherwise wouldn't have access to health care coverage. Um, other than if, if you don't have Badger Care, what you find yourself doing a lot of situations is you're getting your health care through the emergency room which is the most expensive way to get health care, uh, and also the way that you and I pay for other people when they go in. That's that concept called health bottom cost shifting. So if somebody doesn't have insurance, they have an illness or something, go through the medical or the, the emergency room door, can't afford to pay the bill, somebody has to cover that cost, everybody else's costs go up. That's really what, it, what comes, it, it comes down to. And so um, when Governor Evers was talking about expanding Medicare, what we're talking about is getting more people out of the uninsured category and into the insured category so that we don't have that cost shifting. So when we talk about this um, in Wisconsin here, uh, Badger Care really started out back in the late 1990s under the Clinton administration. And we used to have this uh, uh, concept of, of um, what people just generally refer to as welfare and, and programs like that. That was replaced by a program called TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. That started in July of 1999. Uh, initially, that program had 3,400 people in it. By 2000, it had expanded up to 51,000 people. So a very successful program. A lot of people who had never had insurance coverage before now found themselves able to go in and get preventative care, get um, care at the shallow end rather than waiting for things to be really bad and getting the, uh, the expense of what we call deep end care. So uh, this has been a program that really has worked well in Wisconsin. Uh, I want to talk about what Badger Care looked like before the Affordable Care Act and then after the Affordable Care Act. Yep. She's, she's, she's way ahead of me. She knows even better than I do when she should hit the button there. So she did a good job. Uh, so prior to the Affordable Care Act, uh, Badger Care was really um, for 
two categories of people, pregnant women and children under age six, the family incomes added below 133% of the federal poverty level, um, and children aged 6 to 18, um, the family incomes added below 100% of the federal poverty level. Um, since the Affordable Care Act, Badger Care um, is currently limited to people earning up to 100% of the federal poverty level. The parents of caregivers earning between 100% and 200% of the federal poverty level um, lost Badger Care coverage under Governor Walker's revised program. So it's that group of people. The, the course of the poor covered, the working poor not covered. That's really what we're here to talk about, is that group of people that sometimes have, you know, one, two, maybe even three part-time jobs. They don't have insurance coverage through that, so they're working really, really hard, and they're getting nothing for it in terms of any sort of, of insurance coverage. Um, and, you know, when they're looking at uh, going into the marketplace and, and so forth and trying to find coverage, that's not on, through Badger Care. You know, if you're working, you know, um, 20 hours a week at McDonald's and you're making a little bit of a minimum wage, you simply can't afford to buy food, pay rent, and then you know, health insurance, even when it's, it's through the um, through the exchanges. So, uh, current Badger Care coverage sets the Affordable Care Act. If you want to get federal funds, you as a state have to provide medical coverage to those who are earning. Um, 138% or less of the federal poverty level. Wisconsin did not do that. Um, if you do that, what happens is you get this federal match then, um, and the, the last slide that I will be talking about is the one that I think really is what it all comes down to why we're so if, um, enthusiastic about the governor's proposal and upset about what we have foregone. So, by, since 2014, by not expanding Badger Care, Wisconsin really said goodbye to $2.8 billion of federal funds. Those federal funds, by the way, where do those dollars come from? They come from us, right? It's our money that we raise in Wisconsin through taxes. We send to Washington. They're saying, hey, you want this money back? And we're saying, no thanks, you keep it. Send it to California or New York or Florida mm -hmm. or whatever, but we don't want it. That's really what this issue comes down to. And um, Wisconsin would have saved a billion dollars in just in badger care expense alone if we had taken the Medicaid expansion. That is why we are here tonight, because that is our money. It's going elsewhere, and we really believe that it should come back. Governor Evers' budget proposal says, hey, let's take this money back, and you know we can find lots of, of people that need coverage. We can find a lot of um, things like education and transportation and other expenses that we have in Wisconsin that are worthy expenses that we simply don't have the ability to, to, to cover at, at this point. So that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Representative Billings, and she's going to pick up the next few slides. Good evening, everyone. Um, as we see by the map um, above, there are 37 states, including the District of Columbia, that already have expanded into Medicaid. Uh, states that really are majority both sides of the aisle, so um, this is not an extreme idea. Um, other states are doing it and, and are benefiting from this. So as Representative Doyle said, the budget that Governor Evers introduced, the people's budget, um, would cover an initial 82,000 people by expanding Medicaid. Um, the Medicaid program is paid in part by the federal government and part by the state. Under the Affordable Care Act, the federal government pays for 90% of the costs in states that expand Medicaid. That's 90% is paid by the federal government. So um, the thing is that the state's already um, spending this money. Currently, there are 150,000 childless adults enrolled in the Medicaid program here in Wisconsin. The thing is, instead of getting that 90% federal match for this group, we're receiving only 59% from the federal government. Uh, this is money from the federal government for the people that, of Wisconsin, our federal tax dollars that we have paid in that is being left on the table. By expanding Medicaid to 138% of poverty, we're drawing down those funds and using it to expand coverage and access for everyone. And it's important to remember that our current Medicaid program covers parents and childless adults up to 100% of poverty. That's roughly minimum wage at $7.25 an hour. So if this is someone who is a waiter at our local restaurant, a shift worker, 
or your daughter's child care provider. So by expanding Medicaid to 138%, we can help low wage earners take another shift and earn a little bit more money and still have affordable health care. So I've talked to both, I'm sure we all have, talked to both employers and workers who have said that there are people, that they have employees or they're a worker who would like to work a little bit more, but they can't in fear of losing their health care. So if we could accept the Medicaid expansion dollars, we could increase that um, Medicaid to 138%, and we'd have more people who could fill more, more of those uh, hour slots that are, um, that are left open as unemployment is so low. Um, it also helps people whose incomes fluctuate above and below the poverty line throughout the year. There are some workers who, they're always watching paychecks, 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 worried, am I making too much money? Am I going to lose my health care? That's a problem in Wisconsin. So expanding Medicaid is not just about the people who would be newly covered. It also improves access for everyone. With 324.5, with 324.5 million dollars, we say we reinvest it in new initiatives to improve access, strengthen our, our healthcare workforce, and expand coverage for vital services, which draws down additional federal funding. So we can, if we get that money, we can use it in other areas, provide that matching state dollar, and draw down even more federal dollars in Wisconsin. Um, that resulted in a $1.6 billion in new federal funds to the state of Wisconsin. $1.6 billion in new funds to our state. The Medicaid expansion is a lever that we can pull to infuse new federal dollars into the rest of our health care system, a system that impacts all Wisconsinites, not just those enrolled in Medicaid, as we know about cost shift for people who don't have health care that we all and pay. Um, so some of the initiatives that Governor Evers has in his budget to help Wisconsin because of, of accepting Medicaid expansion dollars would help deal with the opioid epidemic that we have here in Wisconsin along with meth and heroin. We, it increases dental access, it addresses health care workforce shortages, increases funding to long-term care programs, reduces health disparities, and provides coverage for health care services and benefits. And Senator so Shulman is going to give us some more of a deep dive into the budget and um, specific examples of how that can benefit Wisconsin. Thank you. Um, as we look at the Medicaid investments, um, some of the specific investments that we make that, that we can make as a state will allow us to have a historic $48 million investment in oral health care. Uh, and for those of you who may or may not know, that's one of the issues that was, uh, I have been working on for years about increasing uh, dental reimbursement rates for our dentists. That if you are a Medicaid patient, it is often very difficult to find a provider in western Wisconsin uh, or across the state, but in western Wisconsin that will accept patients on Medicaid. Uh, one of the programs that we expand with these savings would allow us to increase the dental services to school-aged children. Uh, when kids are free from uh, oral health pain, they can focus on learning. Uh, I am pleased that we've had a, uh, I think it's a three-county pilot program on reimbursement rates for, um, for dentists, and we are seeing, collecting that data and demonstrating that it is a valuable program uh, that works and when dentists receive a higher reimbursement rate, uh, they will accept those uh, the Medicaid patients. Um, to help with local communities, the budget also provides operating funding to support community-based regional crisis um, stabilization centers for adults. So looking at mental health and behavioral health services in that area to help keep people closer to home. We see that people are more successful in rehabilitation if they are located closer to home, the support of family, friends, and a community. Uh, and so those regional stabilization centers are really important uh, where they will have uh, easy access to that natural support system. Also, the budget would leverage federal funding for to um, support lead abatement in approximately 1,000 homes a year. That Governor Evers has talked about uh, 2019 being the year of clean water. 
and one aspect is clean drinking water. And so by looking at uh, the lead uh, laterals that exist in older communities, older cities particularly in, uh, inner, in Milwaukee, but also in other communities across the state, uh, looking to make sure that we can have lead abatement would help uh, address health disparities, improving the quality of housing, and keep future generations from lead exposure. The program will train and license workers uh, in their own communities to help remove lead paint in homes, creating jobs and enhancing uh, workers' future economic potential between the lead uh, in homes and the lead laterals leading to um, into homes. Um, we also extend Medicaid eligibility for pregnant women to uh, one year after birth. That um, the governor has a Healthy Moms, Healthy Babies initiative. Uh, and by giving moms a full year of guaranteed coverage, we will allow them to focus on helping getting their children off to the best start in life possible, while simultaneously ensuring that they get the postpartum care uh, that uh, is sometimes needed, including mental health care to help raise healthy families. And so uh, looking at healthy families, healthy children, healthy communities, it's all linked together. Um, the last investment I will mention through the budget covers many more initiatives. It's our expansion of dementia uh, specialists. Uh, in the budget, Governor Evers increases the number of dementia care specialists from 21 to 48, so that there will be a dementia care specialist in every aging and, and disability resource center in the state. Uh, the number of tribal dementia specialists will also increase from three to six so that every tribe will have access to their own specialist or access through their ARDC. Uh, we also know that expanding Medicaid will have a positive economic impact across the state as well. And as we look at the slide, it demonstrates that uh, the budget supports Wisconsin's direct care workforce by increasing funding for providers in long-term care programs and services, nursing homes and personal care so they can pay these workers a competitive wage. I can tell you for years I've been meeting with nursing home administrators and director of nursing. Uh, I've been meeting with the dentists and with healthcare providers on doctor day. Reimbursement rate, reimbursement rate, reimbursement rate is a continual theme that we have heard about. Uh, and certainly as we look at the shortage of healthcare workers, CNAs in particular, but other areas, we talk about trying to increase wages, increase reimbursement there is a correlation uh, being able to take those federal dollars to expand that. Um, in Colorado, the data shows that the state supports uh, more than 30,000 additional jobs because of the Medicaid expansion. In Montana, another study found that the expansion is estimated to generate $1.2 billion in personal income during its first five years. And another study that was conducted in Michigan and Ohio found that Medicaid makes it easier for beneficiaries to maintain employment. We have a really a golden opportunity uh, to save hundreds of millions of dollars for the state uh, to provide better, more affordable care to the people of Wisconsin and strengthen the economy. That Governor Evers budget really it is built upon the acceptance of these federal Medicaid dollars because the dollars that are used, the state dollars in the Department of Health and Human Services in uh, the health care delivery system, it frees up that money to put towards uh, transportation improvements, to put towards increasing investments in our higher education and our technical schools and universities. It's, it goes towards um, our, our K-12 schools. And so um, the idea that the governor has put this out there, it is really critical uh, in order for much of his other investments in the, in the budget to happen. Uh, we certainly want to leverage Medicaid expansion to its fullest potential ensuring that not only recovering um, residents and supporting them to stay healthy and to work, but we're also improving the economy and recognizing that healthcare systems as our cornerstones in many of our communities and our regions, they're large employers in our communities and getting more money into people's paychecks and pockets is also a win-win. So as we look at um, the various um, opportunities uh, in this budget through Medicaid expansion, accepting those dollars, we want to make sure that we can get our colleagues who on the other side of the aisle have historically said no to this, maybe because of ideology, maybe because we had a former governor who be, was not going to not going to apply for it, and um, it was just not politically viable at that time with um, the former governor and the makeup of the legislature. 
we are seeing some cracks in the door right now. Um, with obviously Governor Evers putting this forward just this week, there's been some conversations and reporting that there might be Republican senators who are open to this. Like we need to get a, find a way to get our Republican colleagues to yes, because in other states it's been bipartisan. Uh, we can't do it with one party alone. Uh, that we need to demonstrate and have our colleagues hear from their constituents uh, as well, uh, of finding a way to get to yes. Because like was mentioned, these are our federal dollars. Uh, we should bring them back to our state and it really will help with the healthcare delivery system and access to affordable um, healthcare here in Wisconsin. So with that, I think that's the last slide. So we're gonna yeah, open up to Q and A. Um, I would just want to do mention, I'll, um, Steve can say a few words, I do want to also recognize uh, that Tammy Baldwin has a representative here, Greg uh, Wabernick is uh, Tammy Baldwin's new Western Wisconsin representative, and so I know that Senator Baldwin was just in La Crosse earlier this week doing an Affordable Care Act uh, uh, listening session, existing conditions, and so certainly want to partner with our colleagues and with our partners in federal government who talk about pre-existing conditions, talk about affordable health care and coverage for all of our citizens here. So Greg, thank you for attending. Uh, I just want to make a couple of comments and address some of the issues that have been raised um, by people who um, are, are opposed to expanding Medicaid. The one that we, the two that hear the most often are, number one, uh, it's just a welfare program. It encourages people to not work. Um, in fact, just the opposite is the case. As Representative Billings mentioned, if you fit into that gap there between you know, the poorest of the poor and the almost poorest of the poor, um, it is to your benefit to quit your job or not take that second or third part-time job and instead, you know, be totally dependent upon government assistance. This is a program that says, no, we want to encourage you to, to take that second part-time job or to take a full-time job that maybe doesn't have benefits. It is in your best interest, it's in our best interest to, to encourage that. Um, this is not some liberal, crazy type of program that, um, you know, that some people are, are saying. If you look at states like you know, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Arkansas, Utah, those are not flaming hotbeds of liberalism. Those are pragmatic governors who are saying, this is money that we could get that you'll just give to us? Um, yeah, we're going to take it. I mean, that, so you know, that's what we're encouraging people to say. Uh, and that leads me to the, the last point, which is that uh, an issue that Governor Walker had raised saying, well, we don't know how long that money is going to come. If we get into this program, what if, you know, next year, the year after, then the federal government changes its mind and says, well, we're not going to do this anymore. The answer to that is very simple. Then we quit. Because the law says you can get in just by saying you want in, and you can get out just by saying you want out. So it's not like you sign up and it's this bait and switch where, ah, now you're on the hook, but we're changing the rules, and guess what? You have to pay for all those extra people that you put into the system. If we, it, just as we got some people kicked out a few years ago, we can kick them back in, and if the government changes the rules at the federal level again in the future, we could take those people back off the rules if we chose to do that. So we have all of the options that, at, that are at our disposal at this point to get in with basically the signing of, of, uh, of a bill and to get out again if we needed to. So we um, want to hear your comments, your thoughts on this. And um, Jen, do you want to kind of? Sure, I have, person in charge? If, sure. Um, if you have slips, and this can be kind of informal, or it's a small group that we can just kind of raise hands and, and call on you as well. Uh, but there were slips uh, at the, when you registered or signed in if you want. I have some, I have one here, so I'll call on this person first. Um, this, this is Becky, but if others of you have conversation or have questions, just please feel or raise your hand or uh, if you would like a slip and we can um, collect your information uh, just so we know have a record of who is here, we can follow up with additional information if it's necessary. But I will call on Becky Dahl from Richland Center. She is the Regional Director of the ADRC Aging and Disability Resource Center of Eagle Country, serving Crawford, Juneau, Richland, and Sauk County. So Becky, thank you very much for Yes, thank you, and um, it was nice to thank you for coming, and nice to meet you. And, um, you know, I just want to say is that I learned a lot today. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in, um, excited about the expansion and very much in support of that, but your presentation today for some points on that, about the whole workforce in Wisconsin, as you know, is that we have a workforce shortage in all our careers. I'm also involved with youth apprenticeship, trying to get youth involved in more of our local careers. But certainly in our healthcare field, it is, as you know, it is a crisis. And so to really support that um, in the Aging and Disability Resource Center, and uh, for example, Crawford County,
County in the British Sheet Office, we'll often see people coming to our office to look for, you know, um, services and supports maybe up in the very rural areas of Crawford County, and there just really is no one available to go into their home and help them. So the next time they come to the ADRC to talk about services and supports, they're often then talking about options for nursing home. Mm -hmm. Because now they've been in their home and they haven't had anybody to help them with nutrition and, 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 and house cleaning, you know, just the basic care, and now they have um, declined in their health care through rapidly. So um, obviously we don't want people to be going to nursing homes sooner, you know, we want to help people to keep staying home as long as we can. Um, it helps you, it helps with our Medicaid as far as people who are, who are less expensive to stay home, but also for folks who have their own resources, um, staying home and paying for, you know, a few hundred dollars a month of in-home services versus going to uh, a nursing home and paying thousands of, you know, and certainly people want to be there. But also in support of our nursing homes, we want quality care there. And so really looking at people um, who are personal care workers and CNAs having livable wages. We often see those workers working two and three jobs, you know, and then of course there's that cycle of many of them are women, that cycle of them not being home because they're, they're um, working. But also that support is wonderful, the opportunity for folks to be able to stay on magic here and to, um, and to work those for extra hours would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly I appreciate the support of the healthcare um, workforce on that. But also we are fortunate in the ADRC Eagle Country in, in Crawford County is we do have a dementia care specialist. And so we're um, very much in support of that expansion statewide. We really see the benefits of somebody who specialized and our customers really know when they we talk about a dementia care specialist, they really looked at having somebody who really has that expertise. I mean, it was just last week that that um, our dementia care specialist and partner with um, Crossing Rivers trained 105 people in the community and Crossing Rivers on uh, dementia live, which is really going through an experience of feeling the, what it's like to have dementia. <laughs> and law enforcement has that as well. So the impact of what that is, so we appreciate that expansion. Um, there is one thing that um, that um, did mention that's kind of a new bill. If I can bring it to your attention just very quickly, I'll give it to you here. What it is, it's a bill that um, it's simply called uh, Improving Access to Medicare Coverage of 2019. As you know, when somebody goes into the hospital, they have to stay three days in, 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 in order for Medicare to cover for them to go into a, a nursing home, right? If they go into two days and then they go into the observation kind of bed, it doesn't count for the third day. And so then what this bill does is it counts those observation days. Okay. So then, um, because what happens is folks, if they if they're need to go to a nursing home and Medicare isn't gonna cover, then they oftentimes go home um, where they didn't have a rehab or they do go into the nursing home and, and once again, spending a lot of their resources and going on Medicaid a lot of their So I'm gonna give this to you to sure. look at. Yep. Perfect. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you. And I think that's a health resolution. We will share that with our delegation, but also with Congressman Kine, uh, Senator Baldwin, so we'll be familiar with yes. HR 1682. But thank you very much. Other comments or questions? Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> when I go to see the dentist and cash and exceeding plus, are they gonna charge me $35 every time I go see the dentist because I've had my dentures for over a year and they won't come on no dentures after a year. They started charging me $35 just to go see a dentist last year, but the year my um, the year for my dentures wasn't up quite wasn't quite up yet. If I go to stay across the same doctor super and uh and cash gym, are they gonna charge me thirty-five dollars every time, I wonder? Because I'm on Medicaid, Badger Care, and the forward health care. Uh, uh, I I don't know the answer. I can look into that. I don't know kind of what their the fee schedule is and if it is a per visit and how um, other other programs come in to help offset the cost, but we can get your name and contact and we can look into that about if that is a, a how that fee is, a, is assessed because and if it's a I per visit. It's old and I, said, I don't think this is right that I should be charged $35 and I did send me another bill. So 
Yes, my right hand little note m must have helped a little bit. I guess. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, so are you currently able to get into Scenic Bluffs and oh, for yeah. dental care? Yeah, okay, because I know they've had a waiting list, and so I'm glad if you're yeah, not on the waiting list. Yeah, I don't list, but I'll probably see the dentist either this year or next year. I hope they won't charge $35 okay. again because I can't afford it. Yeah, we'll get your information. We'll sure, that's fine. Have Sarah or someone okay. take it. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone in the
you know, the whole question. That's a good point. And secondly, uh, I want to clarify an understanding here. I was long mindful that we were giving up three to four hundred million dollars a year since the advent of the ACA. But what's been clarified, I believe, for me tonight is not that the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, mandated the expansion of Medicaid, and therefore, since federal law supersedes state law, we had to expand Badger Care or Medicaid. But, and then, if we did so, we could have gotten federal dollars to offset that. Instead, it afforded the opportunity to expand Badger Care. And if we have expanded Badger Care, we were providing uh, more opportunity for people to enroll at greater percentages of the poverty level. And, that's, and I think that's an important clarification, at least for me. And it's not that we're using state dollars now to pay for a mandated expansion. We just haven't taken advantage of the opportunity to expand that case. Is that correct? The Affordable Care Act can both carrots and sticks. Some of the sticks were things like if you, you know, the <coughs> conditions and so forth, if you didn't cover those things, there were certain penalties. This is one of the carrots where if you want to expand, we will give you more money to do it. And you demonstrated that if you expand, you actually get an economic impact that's very positive. More people employed, more people not afraid to take additional jobs, etc. But the bottom line is, and finally, I believe you addressed another question I had, which is, you know, help me make sure I got this. The reasons for not going for this expansion really are more ideological rather than budget pragmatic. In other words, uh, there's no reason like, oh, there's a catch here, you're going to pay X more 25 years from now. It is simply more or less ideological, oh, if you expand Medicaid, you're getting more people on the dole. That's our belief, is that it's just an ideological, yeah, well, and, and I mean, not to say that people can't have ideological differences of opinion, but I mean, when you look at the numbers and the facts, it seems pretty strong, and I think when you take a look at the governors of those conservative states that are also signing up for this, I mean, that tells you that the numbers are there supporting the logic behind it, and so, so they're setting aside ideology and saying, you know, heck with ideology, I want the money. I think some, some of our colleagues have used the argument of how do we know it's not, it, it may disappear in the future? How does that leave us hanging on the hook? That's not the same argument. I mean, I could use that with federal transportation dollars too. It doesn't really hold true to say anything could, you know, that, that we shouldn't take federal highway dollars here in Wisconsin because who knows what it's going to look like in two to four years if those if that pot of money investment dries up. And so as more and more states are looking at Lower economies, um, cuts that they had to put forward in their own budget, and these legislatures and governors that are are more conservative than here uh, in Wisconsin, um, they are accepting it and they are looking at it as a way to for relief for their own budget issues. So I know, Alicia, you. I'm well, here. I just uh, uh, speaking on the block and saying I was under the impression that if we take the federal money it changes the requirements about how the administration of the program and so that by i don't know if this is true i'm asking for clarification and by rejecting that money then it's allowed the state to take more of the administration and put it into private hands i i, I heard about this through the managed care um and actually tanya might know more about this but that the managed care uh programs have changed quite a bit to private administration and that's sucked up a lot of the dollars and similarly if we were to take the Medicaid expansion money we couldn't it would be it would be all, all in the in the public hands and not in private administration. Does that anybody else heard anything like that? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and I know Secretary Palm of DHS. Um, so she comes to Wisconsin from uh, federal service and working in the previous in the Obama administration. She's very um, familiar with the Affordable Care Act. She kind of uses the term that if we take this, this is um, it pulls a lever for us to to receive these dollars. But there's also opportunities with different matching funds available as well. And so she talks about. 
this money could be used to match some other areas uh, in needs of the budget. And so with Secretary Palm's experience and expertise, uh, she really is meeting with legislators on both sides of the aisle to try to get them to yes and to find a way. And if it's not calling it Medicaid expansion because that clearly has become a political football and using that terminology, but there are other ways that there's kind of a backdoor approach, but we need to have legislative approval of doing this. And if we can find, sure. be, be creative of looking at these revenue, this revenue source as, as an, infuse, an infusion of dollars into Wisconsin that um, I, I have faith that her, in her expertise in the federal government of being at how we could maximize. Yeah, I was just in the, yeah. just heard some people down on Prairie du Chien last year were talking about how the, the changes in the way the money was taken from the federal <coughs> level was changing the, their ability to use the money as efficiently as possible for their patients, for their clients. And I was just curious if uh, you had heard anything like that in managed care. I, and then there was an article in the paper um, where I think some of the, the pressure that's being brought to bear is making a bit of a difference where my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, there's some tension there now where some people are saying, why can't we take this money or call it something else, find a way that we can take this money and feel and um, um, it's in the, in the article. Um, <laughs> now make it look like we're going back on something that we stood so firmly for before. But as Senator Schulman said, with Governor Walker now out of the picture, this was a strong ideological point for him. Right. Now with the new governor, things have changed. Um, I know that there are some members that are getting pressure from their constituents. Majority of Wisconsinites like, want to take Medicaid expansion dollars. Um, the question is, will their leadership open up to that? So, I think people who are weighing in are creating some tension there, which is good. Yes? Um, bear with me, this is kind of multi part, but I, I hope it all will tie together. Uh, some of the uh, concern I've heard about expanding Medicaid uh, from our representative in this district um, is that uh, reimbursement rates are currently so low that more people on Medicaid rolls actually cost health providers. Um, and that instead of expanding Medicaid while well, those rates are so low, we should instead focus on raising reimbursement rates to make sure that our hospitals aren't leaking money. Um, so first, the question is, uh, could you illuminate what the current Medicaid reimbursement rates are for us, for healthcare providers? I, I don't have the, the details on those rates, but I can tell you that one of the groups that is quietly going around really pushing to um, take the Medicaid money is the Wisconsin Hospital Association. Mm -hmm. They're not going to do something that is disadvantageous to them. But, but the simple fact of the matter is you need to do both. I mean, if, if you look at Wisconsin reimbursement rate, we're just horrible. Um, and, and that in and of itself is a problem that has to be addressed along with this issue. So, um, you know, I think we're on the, the same page with regard to both of those. We need to address the situation. You know, in, in Western Wisconsin, we're blessed with a lot of healthcare providers, but they're they're all speaking with one voice, saying we we can't survive much longer and, and provide care in rural areas, especially um, if reimbursement rates don't tick up. You know, and, and not just tick up, but they they need to jump up these expansions. I think it's somewhere the low of forty percent, forty four percent or something reimbursement rate, and I don't know if there's any. Healthcare professionals in the audience to kind of correct me on that, but low 40%. We do not ask our road builders to build a road uh, at, you know, with a 40% reimbursement rate. We, we don't. And so, you know, it's dentists have a low reimbursement rate. Our providers do our nursing homes do. So, uh, it's we need to do that to increase reimbursement rates. So that, that's the okay. third part of my question. Before I get to the second part, uh, my wife is a physician. experience that uh, uninsured patients um, end up seeking emergency care or care through the emergency room often, um, or they delay care until something becomes emergent when it might have been uh, mitigated much earlier with much less invasive, less expensive uh, interventions. So I know from her experience that 
comment on the percentage or number of those 82,000 new Medicaid enrollees uh, that are currently completely uninsured? I know some of them have, for example, might have uh, you know, a little bit of employer-provided health coverage for right now, but it's uh, you know, of 82,000, is there a, a number of those that is completely uninsured right now? My understanding is it's 82,000. Um, I, I don't, I, I think, I, I can look at that and double check and get back to you, but my understanding is that those people have no health insurance. So as you said, they end up in emergency rooms. People have to get insurance on certain things. Mm -hmm. Let things go, problems become worse. They end up in emergency rooms. It costs everyone more. So, and I, I, I don't really understand the representative in this area. I don't understand his rationale when he says, if you accept Medicaid expansion dollars, reimbursement rates will go down. I, I don't understand he, the he rationale. He didn't suggest they would go down. He just okay. suggested that because they are so low, they're already costing our providers money, and so we don't want to add to that burden by expanding Medicaid coverage. That's more yeah. Um, well, but, but I would say that it makes more sense to have somebody come in who has zero reimbursement because they're not going to pay their bill versus Forty-seven percent. Yeah. I'm not suggesting it was a yeah. logical argument. I'm just yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> along with bringing these people on the, um, into the, into Medicaid expansion, is more funding. So, I, I think the understanding is that um, yeah, reimbursement rates would not go down; they would logically go up. And and this is a huge problem for Wisconsin. I'm on the governor's task force on opioid abuse. We know in areas like Superior up in and Bayfield, northern Wisconsin, where you may have to drive over two, two and a half hours to see a provider um, for treatment. Um, people could go right across the border to, to Duluth, where they have openings, but they won't accept people from Wisconsin anymore. They just want to take So the, hang on one second, uh, the, the same representative uh, told us that uh, of those 82,000, I think his number was around 30,000, Um, and the last point, uh, you mentioned raising reimbursement rates for dental providers, and you all acknowledge the need to raise reimbursement rates across the board. Is there any reason the $320 million savings <coughs> that I am couldn't be uh, directed to do exactly that in some form or another? I think they're looking to think that would be part of the plan to look at, because I think it's a, less than half a percent of the Medicaid budget goes towards dental reimbursement rates, and so in order to help access to dental care and to incentivize uh, dentists to see to see those patients, dental reimbursement rates would, would be. Could it be invested in other providers' reimbursement rates as yes. well, theoretically? Yes. Okay, so there's no reason we couldn't take savings and reinvest them in something that addresses the problem. Correct. Right. Thank you. Yes. Um, hi, <clears throat> I'm a retired dental hygienist. So, <laughs> lucky me. So I know something about your mouth. <laughs> <Anyway. laughs> um, and I have worked in private practice and also at clinics. And so at a clinic, I was salaried, so the dentist or whoever owned the business didn't couldn't say, well, it's a lost leader or you're well, I don't get I don't get enough reimbursed. So so that's one thing. If it's in a clinic situation, whether it's a whatever level of care provider, dentist, uh, dental hygienist, they don't have to worry about paying the electric bill and um, whatever products they buy from the sales rep. So anyway, that's one thing. And the other is, it's confusing in dental because when I worked at the clinic, and so I was generally providing in, um, education and cleaning teeth and x-rays and all that. Anyway, so you would find something and you'd say, oh, okay, well, you need, you need this level of care, you need a root canal, you need this, you need that. But your insurance isn't gonna cover that, which was, medic in California, it was Medi-Cal, so it was Denical. So if I slip and say that, that's what I mean. So, but they'd say, okay, well, how much will it cost? Well, probably $1,000 <coughs> after we're all done. Oh, I can't afford that. 
Well, what will my insurance cover? Oh, we'll extract the two. Then you won't be charged anything. So unfortunately, people are left with that because no one, no one takes payment systems, and it, unless they're your brother-in-law or sister-in-law or something. <laughs> and even so, that is a downward slide if you start losing, especially permanent teeth and becoming kids. And then it affects the diet and the overall health. So I know this sounds like a PSA for dental care, but I do know something about it, and I've been on both sides. And um, it's, it's difficult, you know, when you, you go in for, like in, I would think this is with a medical doctor, you go in with a broken arm, and then they find out you've got all this other stuff going on in your body. Well, oh, but sorry, we don't cover that. We're just going to do this. I, I'm seeing that's how I feel like with the dental stuff. Or, well, you really need a crown, but you can't have you can't have a cast crown. That makes you just get a stainless steel crown, which doesn't fit as well. And anyway, not to get too technical, but um, so I, anyway. If you have a question for me, I'm a bit rambling. I didn't make notes as yeah. to be as concise as the gentleman in bed. And I think like the dental example, they have a different business model because most dentists are like small businesses Not that operate. Industry. Yes, and um, they can't really do the cost shift. Like in the hospital, there is there can be co there's cost shifting, and so you've got the the, the private pays with private insurance, and then the dental model that's been reinforced with me over the years that they are really a small business and so their business model is different than say the hospital. Oh they love that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why they found into aesthetic. Yeah. Because, you know, um, you know, uh, Hollywood smiles and you know that not necessarily function. Yeah. Well I'm just this is the the bottom line that healthcare providers don't aren't mandated to take patients with Medicaid. So in other words, there are certain dentists that just simply won't take you as there, Yeah, there are some counties that do not have dentists that will accept Medicaid right. so patients. And, forward, yeah, and up north, and we were talking about some of the counties, you know, up near Ashland Bayfield, uh, my colleague, my Senate colleague, I don't think she is a psychiatrist in her district. And so then you're looking at telemedicine, and that's a different reimbursement. <coughs> set up as well. There's some challenges with telemedicine and telehealth and, met and reimbursement there. So even as we talk about sort of the reimbursement to our physicians and, and nursing homes, but even in telemedicine that they're starting to, that's an issue that we need to get through as well because there's different, uh, a shortage of reimbursement in telemedicine and telehealth. What can we call Medicaid expansion? Where they'll still know what we're talking about, but it's not Medicaid expansion. What can we call it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have noticed that some of my colleagues in the majority party are now referring to it as welfare expansion because they don't want to do it, and oh. and it is the terminology and that that negativity of of how they frame the issue. And I don't want to get into like all oh, really That's the wrong deep, direction. Yeah, that is the wrong direction of Medicaid or of welfare expansion. Um, you know, what we have right now is, you know, is, is well, what we call it is Medicaid expansion, but to talk about, you know, expanding affordable health care for, you know, low income or the working poor in this state. But I, I, I do know that some of my colleagues are now referring it to it in, in a negative connotation. Um, it's unfortunate, I think, as we have seen in polls and surveys that are done in Wisconsin, like the majority of Wisconsinites want us, want the legislature, want the governor to take this money. And so to find, to find a more a, a appropriate or less political term, yes, that's all of our challenge. In Vernon County, there are a lot of very hard-working farmers that are, these families are on Badger Care. Well, many, yeah, many farmers are on, on Badger Care and utilize that for coverage. And I'll, I'll get to you I support the ideologists. I think this whole thing is completely wrong. Free money, there's no such thing as free money. The government's going to give out any ex Medicare expansion dollars. Mm -hmm. They could put a uh, an anchor on that for anything that they want to. Who's 
going to stand up and say, you know what, we don't like the attachment that you're putting to these dollars. Who's going to stand up and say, we're going to have to deny benefits to some people because we're not going to accept those dollars under those terms? Not one of you will. All right? Healthcare is not a right. It simply is, especially at the federal government level. If the state wants to experiment with doing healthcare for its citizens, that's a state People, there is no such thing as health care right. Uh, I disagree with that. I see there were provisions somewhere. Uh, that's not what it means. I mean, uh, animal milk. Well, and I we should, would, we uh, disagree. I, I, I think that it, 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 it's, a, it's a basic human right. And based on what? Stop interrupting him. Based upon being a human being. That's, that, is that in the Constitution? Sure. How? Excuse me. If you're angry and don't want to hear this, what? just leave. We're, We're having, having a conversation. So and, and, and no, he can, he can okay. express his All opinion. Right. That, that's certainly fine. I, 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 I'm okay with that. Um, because it's important that we have this discussion. Um, there is no free lunch, but the money that we're talking about here is money that's already being raised, and it's being divided among the states. I understand. So let me continue, though. So states that are taking it now are taking it and following the rules and are happy with it. So what we're saying is we would like to be one of those states. So we're not talking about raising anybody's taxes. We're not talking about the federal government raising any additional money. We're just talking about the money that is there right now that we can get a slice of that pie. That's really all that we're talking about here. And what if they decide to put attachments on that you don't like? Then we have the right to get out. As I said earlier. I didn't earlier, say get out, but no, we, we say the more, federal portion you disagree with the attachments. It's the, well, here's another example. You know, Senator Schilling mentioned transportation dollars. You know, right now, if you want federal ta transportation dollars, you have to have a 21-year-old breaking age. Wisconsin could say, you know, we don't want to have a 21-year-old breaking age. We want it to be 18. So take your federal ta your transportation That's dollars and stick them. I mean, we could say that, but we choose to, to say, Okay, 21 year old breaking age as part of the deal of getting so the So then you wouldn't give up some of the sovereignty of the state in order to get those dollars. It's yeah, as basic actually, as that. Is it, um, that. That is true. If we don't want to play by the rules, they're the ones that have the money. If we don't want that money, we don't have to follow those rules. If we want the money, I happen to like those rules. I think that they make sense. Pre existing conditions and you know, uh, a greater expansion of who's eligible. I think those are rules that are good rules, not something that I have to hold my nose to accept that money. If there's something in there that I, I said, you know, this is money that we have to get, but man, I just, that is not good that we have to give up this or have to do that. But there's nothing in there that I've seen. What if it comes later? That we get out. That's, I mean, that's what I have said before. Is the law is written that the day you don't want to follow the rules anymore, you write a letter to Washington and say, take your money, we're out of the program. That's all that you have to do. And then you're going to have to deny coverage to the people that have been previously covered. Which we Who's did previously already, though. Remember that. We had 82,000 people that were covered that aren't anymore. We told them once before, sorry, you're out. So, I mean, we could do that again if we chose to. I'm saying, let's get those people back in here for now, and if we don't like it, Sorry, people, you may have to get back out. But what we're saying is, and what I'm saying is, the rules that they're putting down as a condition of accepting that money aren't onerous at all from what I can see. I haven't found a single provision in there that I say, that just doesn't make sense. But the, just like you're saying, the, um, the reimbursement from, this, from the federal government for our mm -hmm. transportation, for our health care, and all these things. Mm -hmm. What if we were living in a more... Um, limited government, where the government wasn't taxing us so much. We all had more dollars in our pocket because we were paying less in taxes. We could afford these things on our own, all right? I haven't had insurance in 19 years. In 19 years, I've spent less than $6,000 on healthcare. And that's good. And, and, and you know, glad well, that you've been able to buy all these insurances. Yeah. Well, okay, I forgot that. I buy health care. My four German Shepherds have insurance. 
I pay less than $350 a month for all four of them. The most expensive one who's taken in $100,000 in claims. I still pay less than $70 a month for him. And it all, a lot of it boils down to tort reform. All right? And so so I, know, I, know the, I know the point that I was going to make when, when you said you know, lowering taxes, for example. That is an issue that you need to take to that guy's boss, for example, <laughs> uh, because this is a federal program that is there. So whether you like it or don't like it isn't an issue for any of the three of us up here. The, the rules as they stand today are that there is this program in place that people, that states can join into. We have no say over whether that program stays or goes. Our position is, because that program is there, let's take advantage of it. If you think that that program should go away and we should lower taxes, take it up with your congressmen, take it up with your senators. If it goes away, we'll have to figure out what we're going to do at the state level. All we're saying is, it's there now. So let's take advantage of what is there now and is being offered to us. I think you're jeopardizing the sovereignty of the state by accepting all these federal dollars. We're and we're happy did you sign in? Like we are happy if you're, there's more yeah. follow-up that is needed. Oh, your we're in. oh okay, well, good. That's we've got your address and wonderful. Kelsey? Um, so I just have a question. I know that there's some talk of Republicans who are interested in finding um, a spot where there can be a compromise. And they were thinking about maybe modeling after um, Utah's program, and I'm not super familiar with what's happening in Utah. Do you guys have any insight about like where those compromises could happen? Um, I was kind of told that maybe there was the option of accepting this money, but then allowing um, almost like a voucher to be used towards like the private market. So then, if people are you know wanting to get insurance to their employer or somewhere else, that maybe they could use it in that way. Um, are you familiar with that idea, or do you know any more about, like I said, maybe Utah's program? I am not familiar with Utah's um, plan. However, I was, um, I had run into Secretary Palm, and I think some are looking at an Arkansas plan, and she described to me that that would not work in Wisconsin. I don't know the details on that, but as we were looking at other states and what models work and don't work, and I don't know if it's, I, I, it's complicated, and I can get back with you and other than just kind of explaining what the um, Arkansas model is. But I know that that's one that some are talking about, and for whatever reason in our delivery system and how we are here in Wisconsin, it would not work. I don't know if it's because of population size. I, I don't know because of how our health system is and our delivery um, system insurance and things like that. But I don't know. Are you familiar with the... No, I saw that insurance? article, too, and I don't remember the details of it. Um, it, it is... It, 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 that's where we're really lucky to have Secretary Paul because she is the expert. I mean, that was one of Governor Beaver's best hires, I think, is bringing somebody that understands the most complicated system in the world. And that's really where we're at right now. Okay, and then I had a couple other just little questions. Um, one was regarding supportive home care or personal care workers. Um, with the managed care organizations, as Alicia was kind of talking about earlier, um, I heard that there was money going to be directed in that realm to increase wages, but I'm wondering about the self-directed options, um, such as like the IRIS program, where folks are able to hire family members or friends um, from the community to actually be helping them with those personal cares in the home. Would they also be seeing um, like their wage increases? I think that's a provision of budget that we have to do a little bit of research on.
that would be the reason for doing, you know, having that increase up to 138. Because otherwise, you've got another group of people that that you can say, well, they're being treated differently. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then I guess, like, are there misconception that I heard that I just wanted to comment on was um, people just saying, you know, the most vulnerable populations already have sort of like a safeguard, and there's those sliding scale. Um, programs or, you know, we have scenic bluffs, but why do we need all of these other things? Um, and I'm just not quite sure if people recognize really like the waiting lists and the overall utilization of, um, for instance, the emergency room. And, you know, it, it might not always be that a person is denied care if, like, let's say they break their arm and they go to the ER. Um, however, you know, people are waiting until it really gets that bad and it is costing us more money or, you know, they're trying to get into scenic bluffs, but then they have a Wait, so mm -hmm. something that was just a little cavity now all of a sudden, you know, is much worse and there's an infection. So um, I guess I just wanted to comment that I'm, I'm seeing that in our area and it's, yeah. you know, difficult. Well, and Scenic Bluffs is a FQHC, Federally Qualified Healthcare Center. They have higher reimbursement rates than, say, a dentist who is not part of the FQHC. And so the dentist that I see in the cross and I was just there yesterday, um, his reimbursement rate is lower than the FQHC. So even within the healthcare system, there are inequities depending on where you are, the model that you're practicing under, seeing patients. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, if, so to comment on the dental issue, um, it's certainly a big part of people's health and infections in the mouth can cause negative consequences all over the body, including the heart. And um, we've also expanded senior bus into the hospital recently, so I'm not sure everybody realizes that, but there's more access to that. And, um, for dental care, for dental right there after senior Senior bus yep. dental, yeah, yep. we should separate because there's senior bus health care too. Um, another thing that I wanted to comment, we haven't really touched on, is underinsured. I have a lot of farmers that have a huge deductible that basically they're uninsured because they won't go in. basically catastrophic coverage. Well, I just, I wanted to say that um, I, I, I think it's a really good move in the right direction, so thanks for holding this, because it's really <coughs> helpful, I think, for people to understand. Uh, and, and to the gentleman's point um, about tort reform and that those problems, I actually think that the problem is has more to do with the private healthcare industry and uh, an insatiable need for profit from shareholders. And I think that this, the move towards a Medicaid expansion will help people see that that's actually a really reliable way to get healthcare done. And I think that there's plenty of uh, healthcare providers that feel that way too. Of course, we need to raise the reimbursement rates, but I think that we can raise the reimbursement rates if we can dampen down the profit sector as much and, and take some of that profit and put it into um, the people who are actually giving the care. And then we'll have more people entering the field as well. So I think it's a move in the, in the right direction, I think. Thank you for your work. Sure. Without profit, you're not going to have innovation. That's not, simple not fact. Getting what? Without profit, you won't have innovation. That's demonstrably incorrect. Sorry. Yeah, yeah the government. The, um, as far as you know, the, uh, the hospitals getting behind supporting this program and all that, just like the colleges, why they're behind um, uh, student loans and all that stuff, because it's a backstop by the taxpayer. So hospitals support, take Gunnerson. Gunnerson operate out of four cinder block walls instead of beautiful facility that they have. What, they, what did they expend on that facility that they could have put into other quality health care, right? So hospitals want guaranteed money for the programs that they're running. That's why they're supporting this. Same way with college tuition and stuff. Which college has ever lowered its tuition after having been told with, you know, by representatives that will guarantee uh, affordable education? No school has ever lowered its tuition. Hospitals won't lower the rates if they know they're going their backstop. If there's certain, if the hospital's providing services that's too expensive and nobody's partaking in it, 
they either reduce the service or they do away with the service. The cost of the service is do away with the service. It's just simple economics. And by providing a taxpayer backstop, all you're doing is encouraging higher prices. That's simple. Yeah, unfortunately, we have one of the worst health care systems in the entire world. What? Oh, yes. You have the best health care in the world. Why do people come to this country? Calm down, all over? calm down. We can have a logical discussion if we want. But we're the 17th ranked health care system in the entire world. We're first for cost. We use our money poorly. There's a lot of waste. There's, believe me, there's enough blame to go around all over the place. I certainly agree with your statement about privateering. We're supporting drug companies. They sell their drugs across the border in Canada cheap. We're supporting them and we're paying them, lining their pockets. We have a lot of administrative costs that are overdone. Tort reform, I agree with you on that. We have something in Canada. I didn't say you couldn't be, have regulation. Well, we have the best health care. No, we don't. <laughs> health appropriate might be just If you look at the facts, we have. We still have the most innovations. We have the. Um, in one sense, we do, we do. We have a really good health care system if you have money. But if you don't have cash, if you don't have insurance, you're stuck. The federal government shouldn't take so much of our cash. We have people coming over from Saudi Arabia to go to the Mayo Clinic because it's the best in the world. But overall, our system is very poor. We're, we don't take care of the, of the people that we need to. We don't take care of pregnant mothers. We don't take care of infants. Um, and babies. I'm telling you, we have a poor health care system. Whether whose whatever function it is, it's not a good system. We can do a lot better than we do. Okay, we've got two question. Um, I wonder if you could just lay out real quick uh, for a lay person like myself, uh, when it comes to negotiating uh, these reimbursements, who is part of that process? Like, um, yeah, I guess who's involved? Are, like the hospitals, I'm sure, and then you guys, um, yeah, if you could just lay that out a little bit for me, that'd be great. Well, the legislature really does not have a seat at the table to negotiate the reimbursement rates. I think it's probably it's federal government is the CHS. Yeah, yeah. So the federal government, state has some input. It would come through Department of Health Services or waivers for certain things, but um, Governor Walker actually got a waiver for um, mental health reimbursement, I think a couple years ago. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a complicated, multi-tiered, like m most things in healthcare. Right. Okay. Thanks. Tell me in the back. Um, I was curious if this budget includes Anything about like people have talked about the issues that we have now with healthcare, how the money spent now, did the budget address that? Like maybe addressing places where there's too much profit or addressing or people places that are not transparent <coughs> how they get their money or how to organize? Does that this budget include anything addressing that? I'm trying to think of uh, there's legislation that's been proposed to deal with a few different issues. One is um, prescribing um, medications. Um, so I'm trying to think of items in the budget that would
Kelsey is a uh, wonderful advocate on many areas of the budget and is familiar and comes to Madison. And, yeah. and part of making class at UWL, so we debated this today and I had to go over the comms. So. Oh. <laughs> healthy 
need and, and build a program that they are really important. Another statistic um, in, in this report, I think, was that 48% of Wisconsin maternity costs are covered by Medicaid. 48%. That tells you the need of, for young families for support. I think if you looked at the statistics for Boston and Vernon County, you'd be more surprised. Yeah, I was just looking, I knew that there was a, we have a Governor Evers budget on supporting Vernon County. Um, and as we look at um, some of the statistics, three point, uh, well in, in Vernon County we see $9 million of new investments in Vernon County. Uh, that would be 3.4 million to expand Medicaid to an estimated 423 Vernon County residents. Um, 234,000 expanding access to behavioral health, including crisis intervention, and telehealth services, $84,000 to preventing childhood lead poisoning through lead abatement and supporting child with lead poisoning through the birth to three program, a little over $200,000 in improving access to dental services by increasing payments to dental providers, including, including those who provide um, service to people with disabilities and expanding the Seal a Smile program that we see in schools. Uh, $450,000 um, enhancing Medicaid benefits and services uh, to new community health benefit and postpartum coverage and for new mothers. $305,000 increasing funding for physicians. $155,000 increasing funding hospitals. Uh, $462,000 increasing funding for providers in long-term care and services, including family care, IRS and nursing homes, and boosting personal care worker wages. Um, talk about the dementia care specialist, that'd be $188,000 in uh, investment here in Vernon County. Uh, $4.3 million uh, to provide coverage to current Medicaid, Badger Care Plus, Senior Care, and food share employment and training program members, and permanently ending the wait list to serve all eligible, eligible children in the Children's Long-Term Support Waiver Program. I think that's an area that the governor would like to eliminate that waiting list throughout the state uh, for children on that long-term support program. And then finally, $27,000 supporting the mental health uh, consultation program uh, with conditional and supervised release and dispatcher-assisted cardiopulmonary resuscitation program. So that's a little bit of a breakdown. If you would like that, we can get this information to you about how serving Vernon County uh, here can, what those dollars mean to services. And we have Crawford County as well. Yeah. Some people have them on your chairs, otherwise they're at the table over there. Yeah. So with that, any other last comments if, or questions? We can stick around a little bit, but I do want to thank you for attending. Good conversation. We appreciate um, hearing these questions, the feedback, the observations, the insight that you have. And uh, this is a process. The, the budget is a process. Right now it is in the hands of the Joint Finance Committee who have completed <coughs> their four statewide listening sessions and they will be voting starting their executive session probably May 9th or so in about a week to 10 days that they will start voting and, and either accepting Governor Evers' proposals, amending it, changing it, putting in their own ideas uh, as the Finance Committee moves forward and then on to the legislature. And we've heard that the Finance Committee would like to uh, wrap up their work by the end of June and then on to the legislature in July. So we will see what happens on that on that timeline. It is um, a divided or shared or split legislature with a governor, Democratic administration, or Republican legislature. So we will see what will have to happen on compromise moving forward on some of these. And you had a question and then we'll call on you. So my understanding with the JFC is anything in the budget can be removed from it by the Joint Finance Committee, is that correct? They can, well, we have a, the memo will be coming out about policy in the budget, and so any items um, that are deemed yeah. policy from the nonpartisan fiscal bureau um, will be removed. Okay. Some of that could be put in, back in, depending on sort of the definition of policy from the co-chairs and the committee. Um, they can, we've heard that the Republicans who control the legislature would like to look at starting at really governor 
would be Governor Walker's base budget. So the second year, budgets are two years, so Governor Walker's second year budget would sort of be the base budget that they would be operating under. Um, but we'll see what they do if they, they accept any of Governor Evers' starting points. And there could be some common ground on some of these issues. So in other words, everything is up for grabs yes. in, in the proposed budget. Yes. So how do folks in this room make their voices heard to the Joint Finance Committee? Uh, you can go online and contact through email, call their offices. Every office has an 800 number. And I think those 16 members, there are 12 Democrats and four Republicans. To, um, oh, oh, shoot. That was, that's a good slide. That's a good Yeah. All right. There are 12 Republicans, four Democrats. Um, and shoot. Um, so contact those legislators. But I think also as legislators, I mean, Representative Oldenburg is not on the Finance Committee. He is a freshman first term legislator. Continue to contact his office, uh, myself as your state senator, but also surrounding legislator, leg regional areas as well. And so I just think that that information and your calls and comments are really important. So it could be the toll free number, it could be email, it could be mail it stamp, old fashioned, anyway, that, but that, that, con that conversation and dialogue is important, that feedback. Okay. And to kind of take off on that, I'd like to contact Representative um, Oldenburg close to when he's gonna be potentially voting on this. Okay, and he's doing listening sessions as well. Um, I think last night he was in Cashton, I think he's got he's two more. Last week. He was here last week? Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I think if he makes himself available, um, stop by his listening sessions as well. So maybe he only has one more that he will be When will there be a vote that he's involved in? We don't know that. But it will be sometime this summer. Okay. But, but then, I mean, if, you're, if you want him to work to add something or take something out of the budget, you really need to contact him now. Okay. Yeah, everybody has a budget. Budget. 